Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Monday. It is April 5th. And welcome to a critical Columbus COVID-19 conversation with COSI's Dr. Frederick Bertley. I love the alliteration with all of that. I'm Angela and great to see all of you virtually here on the Zoom. It is great to see everyone. I'm Tracy Townsend. We have been talking about this because we really are very excited because of course we all know it's been a very challenging year or more uh, to say the least. And now that we have the vaccine for COVID-19, we can take a little bit of a breath. I mean, I wanna take a sigh. There's that light at the end of the tunnel, the return to a new normal or a normal. Uh, and we know that many of you still have questions about the vaccine and how to get the best information about the vaccine and making the choice to get vaccinated. Information is critical. Information is so critical, which is why we have the expert. And I wanna say the expert, right? Because when we're talking to Dr. Bertley, um, he is a globally recognized educator and immunologist. And Dr. Berkeley, you've always talked about letting the science dictate where we go. And that can be really intimidating for a lot of folks, right? Who maybe didn't do so well in science class. <laughs> Just saying. But Dr. Berkeley, you are a thought leader in so many fields, applied science, science education, community engagement. And it's really making this science a lot easier for people to understand at any age. It's great that he is here at COSI and we have this access and we have lots of questions too. Dr. Bertley is going to take those questions, but first he's going to walk us through a little background on how vaccines work. You can take notes. It's probably the best science class you've had or will ever have. Dr. Bertley. Well, first of all, I wanna absolutely thank um, Channel 10, 10 TV for, for um, taking the time to do this with us. I especially wanna thank you uh, Ms. Townsend and you, Ms. Ann, I mean, you guys are super busy, slammed with everything that's going on and the new cycle does not get old. So you guys are really busy. Um, so thank you for taking the time and sharing uh, 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 some time with us here at COSI. So to your point, what I'd like to do is, is jump and share my screen, if that's okay. And then I'll walk through, I, I, you mentioned, you put some pressure on me, Ms. Townsend, telling me this is gonna be the greatest science class ever. We'll see how I do, you can rate me afterwards. <laughs> there are no grades that are bad grades, all right. So let me share my screen. Just wanna confirm that you can see my screen okay? Okay, so um, the first thing, before I begin, a little confession. I like to confess at the beginning of every one of my presentations. So true confession, social media has been around for 20 years and um, I've managed to dodge it for all 20 years. And I wanna be clear, it's not that I had a Facebook account and I shut it down, I was on Twitter. I've never, ever been on social media, but we got this cool new program called QED with Dr. B. So my whole team put the pressure on. So I'm finally on social media. So with that, a month and a half ago, I launched my first Twitter account and I put a haiku on every single morning. I won't tell you how long and how hard that is, but every day my thing is put out a haiku. So I just share that, feel free to follow me. All right, let's just jump into the vaccines. So let's go over the science of coronavirus real briefly. So here's the virus, you all know it, you're sick of seeing it. But one thing I wanna make sure you all appreciate is that if you think about the size of how coronavirus is compared to us, we as humans, all of us on this call, all of 7.7 .7 billion people on the earth have 20,000 genes. These are the bits of DNA that code for everything we do. If you look at your fruit fly, if you leave a mango or orange around or banana in your, on your kitchen, that has about 13,000 genes. You look at the common bacteria, um, anywhere from 6,000 to 5,500, 600 to 5,500. When you look at coronavirus, there are only 14 genes. This thing is tiny, yet it's completely devastated the entire planet, messing up workflow, messing up our lives, and most importantly, killing many people, which brings us to putting it in perspective. For those of you old enough, you remember the SARS um, whole pandemic? We only had 700, I don't say only because every death is symbolic, absolutely. But by comparison, only 774 deaths. Remember the H1N1 in 2013? In the world, under 20,000 deaths. Coronavirus alone in the United States, over half a million. And in the world, almost 3 million people have died and about 30 million infected. So this is really horrific. What we've experienced, and I love how you said it, both of you, the light is on at the end of the tunnel with these vaccines. But what we've experienced has been really dramatic, all right? And to put in perspective, the flu every year, anywhere from 10,000 to 50,000 people might die in the US. So just crushing what we've come used to. All right, let's get into the science of vaccines. So the concept of vaccine is very simple. 
all of us, unless you were born with a genetic mutation like the bubble boy from like the 90s, um, all of us have what's called an immune system. It's our defense system that protects us from the hundreds of thousands of bad stuff that we get exposed to all the time. So I have a little analogy of a little soldier here. Well, if you get a bad bug, sometimes the bad bug can replicate fast enough. It can replicate at such a high level that it overpowers our innate immune system, the immune system we have that we're born with and that develops over time through into puberty, right? So the concept of vaccine is very simple. You take the immune system we already have, so it's not creating anything new. We already have this immune capacity in our body and it adds a bunch of stuff, strength training, going to the gym, working out, high protein shakes, you name it. And it beefs up the immune system. So now instead of having one little wimpy cell or soldier, you have all these cells, all this strong capacity response. So now you get a bug and the bug replicates, but you have enough of an immune response to crush it and make us feel healthy. That's the very simple concept of a vaccine, regardless of the types of vaccines you have. It's all the same concept to build on what you already have in your body and make it stronger. All right. How do you actually make a vaccine? So in general, you come up with an idea in what's called in vitro in the lab um, and uh, you play around in the lab and you come up and you show that, hey, wait a minute, I have a candidate vaccine here. Once you can show that, you're allowed to do what's called animal studies. And you start first in mice, rats, rodents, um, and you test to see if the vaccine is gonna generate an immune response. So you vaccinate the mice and hey, the mice, the mice had the immune response you wanted. You feel good, you reproduce it three times, you're excited. Then you go back to, by the way, you have to go for what's called IRB, which stands for Internal um, Review Board. Basically it's getting permission to do animal studies. You can't just say, oh, I'm gonna do animal studies. You have to get government permission to do this. Once it works in mice, then you go back again and apply for a higher level permission to do what's called vaccine studies in non-human primates. I'm talking about monkeys, um, chimpanzees. Why? Because they are really close to us. How close to us? The average chimpanzee, ape, gorilla, or monkey is 99% genetically identical to all of us on planet Earth. So, so if you can show a vaccine works there, then you're really off to the races to show it can work in humans. And I got to tell you, you know, animal studies are hard. I have a very sensitive heart, of course, to working with animals. Um, it's one of these kind of greater costs. That's the only way we can test it because we can't test it in humans um, without having any kind of safety control. So you test it in animals. Similarly, it works really well. The monkeys are protected. You feel good. So now you get permission. You have to go back now to the Food and Drug Administration and say, okay, here's all the data. Here's all my research. I have a study that I have a vaccine candidate. I want to do what's called clinical studies. So you publish your information, you get it out there in the scientific community, everybody rips apart your science, make sure it's absolutely on point. Then you get approval from the FDA to do what's called clinical trials. There are three clinical trials normally, phase one, phase two, and phase three. Phase one, you're just testing, is the vaccine candidate safe? You're not looking to see if it works. You just want to know if I introduce this into people, is it going to cause people to be sick? Are there going to be adverse effects or are they going to be okay? These are done in small groups, anywhere from a few hundred to maybe 500 people. Once you show that it's safe, you have to go back to the FDA, get approval again to do a phase two study. Um, and this is now in anywhere from hundreds to thousands of people. Now you're looking, is it safe in a bigger population? Because, you know, sometimes things bear their head only when you have a big enough population. And now you're also looking, is it giving you an immune response that you want, a protective immune response? If that looks good, and you can see the time, normally it takes two years for that one, normally it takes a year for the first one. And phase three can be anywhere from three to four years. Now you're doing what you did in phase two, except now you're working in like tens of thousands of people and not just locally across the planet, different countries, different countries, all genders, religious backgrounds, you name it, you are experiment, you are giving this to many people to make sure it's safe and it's developing the immune response that's protecting you. Once all that goes through, then great, you got your vaccine. So now let's jump to the specifics of the COVID vaccine, which is at this heart of today's discussion. So in terms of the COVID vaccine, to understand what you're doing, I'm gonna quickly do a clinic as to how the virus actually infects the cell. So on the top left where the arrow is, that's a coronavirus binding onto a cell to get inside of our cells in our body. Follow the red arrows. Once it's inside, it actually hijacks our own cellular machinery. So the virus, remember I told you it only has 14 genes. So imagine going on a, on a, on a vacation trip, all you got are a pair of Speedo underwear. You got no credit cards, you got no jacket, no pants, you got no, you don't have a car, you don't have food. So wherever you go, you take over the hotel or the host or whatever to get some clothes, get some this. That's what the virus does. It takes over your whole machinery and then it makes copies of itself 
and it shoots the copies of itself out of the cell. That's all the virus does. It gets in, hijacks your machinery, makes copies, and then those copies go on to keep infected. All right. Well, the key thing about how a virus gets in, it doesn't break into your house like a burglar. It doesn't sneak through a window or smash a door. It actually has a key to your lock. And this is critical to understanding how the coronavirus works. So um, how does it work? You remember, it's called the coronavirus, right? It's called the coronavirus because of those bumps on the outside that looks like a corona. Those are glycoproteins. Glyco means sugar, proteins are proteins. They're very sticky. That's how the virus binds to your cells. So if you follow this picture here, that green little thing you're seeing in the bottom right, that's the receptor on our host cell. The virus comes along and it binds to it. How strong? Well, if you look at a wet piece of sticky paper, like a, uh, you know, a, a little post-it and that was wet and you put on your marble or a granite countertop and it sticks or you put on a glass, it kind of sticks, right? But you can peel it off. So it's a little sticky, but compare that to Velcro. Velcro is way stickier. That's how coronavirus is. It binds so strong to the receptor and that's why it's really infectious. That's why you got to stand six feet apart because if it gets close to you, it can bind and it'll get in. All right. So the way the vaccines work is they want to disrupt that lock and key mechanism. They want, they want to block how the virus gets into the cell. If it doesn't get into the cell, it can't replicate. So here's now a pretty picture. On the bottom left is your cell and the top is the virus. And what you're seeing, this is the lock and key interaction. And so the vaccines, all three of the vaccines that we're gonna talk about, Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson's, all work by blocking that interaction. All right, now in terms of vaccine types, here's just a, a chart showing you all kinds of vaccines. If you were born and you are living and breathing oxygen, especially if you're an adult, you've had a bunch of different kinds of vaccines, whole inactivated vaccines, live attenuated synthetic peptides, whether you had a tetanus shot, measles vaccine, mumps, rubella, you name it, hepatitis. The, we've had these for years, like going back, uh, you know, back to Jenner in the 1700s, but certainly over the last 100 years, we've had all these in our bodies. What's really interesting is the vaccine candidates that we're using right now, or the vaccines that we're using right now, it's actually new technology. And I want to be clear, new technology in humans, We've been doing this in animals for years in the cattle industry, et cetera, but this is the first time in humans we're actually using them. You've all heard about the RNA, 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 and now you're hearing DNA. Um, and so the Johnson & Johnson one is using a slightly different thing called the recombinant viral vector, but basically it houses DNA in the Johnson & Johnson's compared to the Pfizer and Moderna that house, house RNA. And how does it work? What happens is you inject the DNA or RNA into us, into humans or animals, but in this case we're talking about humans, and that RNA or DNA, remember DNA is a genetic material that codes for something. So this codes for that glycoprotein that I showed you, the spike protein. And what happens is your cells crank out a lot of these proteins. And so now you've got these glycoproteins that are floating around in your body. And what do they do? They actually stimulate an immune response. So these cells called B cells, they trigger the B cells to produce what we've all heard about in the media called antibodies, right? They also do something later on that, that stimulates um, something called T-cells as well. But for now, we're concentrating on antibodies. These are the SARS-CoV-2 protective antibodies that are now circulating in your body that if you do get exposed to coronavirus out there, now you have a stronger military, if you will, to handle that bug that's coming to you. So that's how the vaccine works. So now we got the vaccine. We know there's DNA and RNA versions. Um, just real quick, some faces. In the US, this is the first person to volunteer to get the vaccine. So thank Jennifer Heller, if you ever meet her. Wonderful woman. She actually ended up being, um, this is her getting shot, and she ended up being a celebrity. Her, kid, her daughter and son were super famous in the town they're from because her mother's considered a hero. In the UK, this is one of the first of two people to get the UK virus. And she's interesting because she's actually a cancer PhD research scientist. I um, mean, she wanted to help, but she doesn't know anything about immunology vaccines. She said, how can I help? So she volunteered to be the first person actually be vaccinated. So pretty cool. Um, what's important though, while you saw those people, by now we've had over 150 to probably 200,000 people around the globe, different races, different age groups, different genders, of course, um, being vaccinated to make sure as a, as a trial to make sure they're safe. And now, of course, we have millions of people who've been vaccinated um, because of the push in this country and elsewhere. All right. I want to put in perspective a little scope because we all hear about two or three or four vaccines in the media. It's important to understand there's one 117 vaccine candidates in clinical trials right now. This is amazing, right? 48 in phase one, 33 in phase two, um, 23 in phase three, um, six have been authorized, 
Um, seven have been approved, and we can talk about the difference of that in the Q&A, and then um, four have been abandoned. We can talk about that as well. So you can see, we talk about Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, and of course, Johnson Johnson's, and that's great, but there are so many others. Now, we don't need all those. We'll talk about it later, but I just wanted to share that with you. All right. How do you get a vaccine approved? So now you got your candidates, you tested it, it looks good. You got this clinical data, you tested in humans, great. How do you actually get it approved to go to scale? So in the UK is different from the US. In the UK, they actually have this group called the Medicine and Healthcare um, Products Revol Regulatory Agency. They look at your summary data that's supplied by the company. Very easy peasy. The company says, here, here, regulatory, here's the data. Oh. They look at it and they say yes or no. In the US, we are much more stringent than that. The Food and Drug Administration oversees the whole process. And one, it reviews everything from A, the company summaries. So yes, we get the company summaries. But beyond that, we get, how did you manufacture it? Like talk to us about details about you actually, how you came about this. Then on top of that, we then look at the individual patient level. This is critical because it might, the vaccine might work in me a little differently than in you, Tracy, or you, Angela. And we want to know exactly how different they are to make sure we're making the best decision. Um, then they look at anything else they can find based on your clinical studies. Then after that, that's the FDA, which is a government organization. Then after that, it kicks it over to a non-government organization. You've heard about it in the news, the Vaccine Advisory Committee. These are immunologists in the US that are world-class experts, but they're not paid by the government. They're, they're not government employees and they're independent. And they look at the data and they recommend first the emergency authorization that you've heard about. They continue to look at the data as people get vaccinated. And then they actually make the decision to say, yes, we can use it. So if folks are scared about kind of the government being involved, you know, we all get the, for whatever reason, we may have that fear. It's important to understand it's a non-government independent group that is not part of the biotech industry, by the way. So they don't have any stocks in any of the Johnson John, you know, they're not, they're independent people saying, hey, it's safe or it's not safe. And by the way, that last bullet point on the left, the data, and this is the best part about how the Food and Drug Administration operates, the data is available for all 355 million Americans to see. Matter of fact, anybody in the world can see it. So you can go look at the actual data and sort through it. All right, once all that happens, boom, you get it approved. So real quick, as I get to closing, what's the difference between the RNA and DNA vaccines? So we know the RNA, again, Moderna, Pfizer, DNA is the um, Johnson & Johnson's. One, without getting into scientific detail, RNA stands for ribonucleic acid, whereas DNA is deoxy. The difference is something called a hydroxyl group. If you've ever drank alcohol, there's something called OH. That's what makes alcohol alcohol. There's an extra OH in the DNA, which makes it more stable. And that's really important because you can talk about Pfizer and Moderna versus Johnson & Johnson's is um, one of the big differences is the price, right? Johnson Johnson's um, is about roughly 20, sorry, the Pfizer one is roughly $24 per dose. I mean, by the way, these are the doses that are, are this cheap because the government has subsidized that. After the government goes away, these prices are going to jump. So we can talk about that later. But right now, it's around $24 to $30 per dose for the Pfizer one. Um, it's about $15 to $20 for Moderna. And the Johnson Johnson is quite a bit cheaper at $8 to $10, right? And you might ask why, and it gets back to this slide. The reason why it's cheaper is DNA is way more stable than RNA. That's why you need that you know, minus 70 freezer for the RNA vaccines and cool. DNA is very, very stable. You don't need that super expensive cold chain to, to, to preserve the vaccine. So, and it can last a lot longer too on your shelf, which is great. All right. And so finally, the last thing I want to talk about is what's on everybody's mind, mutants, mutations. I want to level set and make sure we all understand that a year ago, April, 2020, we've already discovered over 30 different genetic variants of of this vaccine so i know everybody's talking about it now and it got really popular kind of january now february march april it, we've known for a year that there's all these variants out there okay um why is it important though because what we found out is some of the variants some of the variants actually have mutations in that glycoprotein area that spike area and that mutation it can be a very small change that might make it more sticky you see in this slide it says approved effectiveness remember that velcro example it makes it that much bigger, more Velcro, so it's more sticky. And because it's more sticky, that's why you hear in the media, they say it's more infectious or contagious. It just means it can get into your cell better. Okay, the key in the keyhole is smoother, if you will, faster entry. It doesn't make you more sick, 
the pathogenesis or how you get sick is roughly similar, but you get infected faster and easier because of certain mutations, not all mutants, but some of them, right? And then the other piece that's important to understand is when you're thinking about will vaccines work? Well, it really depends where the mutations are. So here I'm showing you three mutations. We write the bottom one, the N501Y, you can see it's very close to that blue thing. That's the key and lock mechanism, that's the receptor. So if the mutation happens there, it can really impact if the virus can get into you or be protected by the vaccines um, versus the other two that you see that aren't in the area that binds. And then lastly, real quick, so again, all three vaccines work on the glycoprotein area, right? So on the top, you're looking at antibodies, that the vaccines made. On the bottom, you're looking at the original um, variant of coronavirus. And you can see that the antibody binds nicely to it. When it binds nicely to it, boom, it could kill it, and that protects you. You might have a mutation. Here you have a mutation with six red mutations, right? Well, those mutations have happened, but guess what? They're not impacting the antibodies that were generated by our immune system to bind to it. So your antibodies can still bind to it. Boom, you control the virus. You don't get infected. However, if the mutations are so severe or happen in a different area, then you can see what happened. The antibody can't really bind to it. And that's what we just don't know yet. We'll find out more as time goes on. So with that, I wanna thank you. Um, happy to take questions real quick. There's a really cool show if you like science. It's a weekly show called QED with Dr. B, Wednesdays at 7.30 PM. And again, if you wanna follow me at Twitter, I'd love it. Feel free to hop on. And so now happy to take questions. I'll unshare my screen. Wow. First of all, that was just amazing. I think Tracy, you called it. Uh, Dr. Burley, that was possibly the best science class, right? If you were my science teacher, I'd be a doctor too. Well, listen, this is what say. we love about COSI. We try to make science accessible and engaging. So thank you for saying that. we got a team of people that do this all day. That variant, that last slide was phenomenal. I was like, oh, that's good. It's really good. Right. And, so, and that goes through so many of the questions that we have been getting from people, Dr. Burley, about the variants, about um, you know, what I should get and what I shouldn't. So we're going to kind of hit all of them as fast as we can, because I know our time is limited as a mom. And I know, you know, Tracy, her, my, my daughter, but you know, as a parent, you're wondering the vaccinations for children, right? Yeah. They're in the process. still. I think they're in that stage clinical trial too. Mm -hmm. um, when do you think it will be safe for kids under the age of 16 to get the vaccine? because we're seeing the 12 to 16 now coming out, but my daughter's eight. And I'm wondering, yeah. when will that come out? Do I want her to have it? You know, is it just like getting the flu shot for her? Like how safe is it? Because their bodies are so different. Yeah, I mean, great question. So, so the first thing is um, the process for safety uh, to test the safety of vaccines is the same in all people. But because children are children, we, we have a higher level of scrutiny. We'd rather test, when I say we, Food and Drug Administration or, or just countries around the world, we test in adults, right? You get consent, et cetera. And so we test once it's safe in adults, then we say, okay, we have enough, we have millions of people now, adults who have this, it's safe. Now let's start really expediting some tests in younger folks. And they don't go straight to like, you know, neonatal kids. I mean, they, they go, as you mentioned, from kind of 15 to 20 or 14 and sometimes 16, depending. So now, as you saw last week, Pfizer actually published definitive data, and this is incredible, that their test thing on 15 to, to 20 year olds had literally 100% of these people protected. And the group, to give you a size of the sample size, they tested, they, not tested, they vaccinated 2,200 people. And of that, half of them got placebo, half of them got the vaccine, and 100% of the people who got the vaccine we're protected from coronavirus. So that's really exciting news. Now to your question, Angela, so now folks like Pfizer and Moderna and others are actually testing in much younger kids. And now we're starting from infants all the way up to like 12 and 15 years old. So that data is gonna come out. Once it comes out and it's clear that, hey, there's no adverse effects, um, just like in, in, in adults or the adverse effects are within that tolerable range, which is like, you know, 0. 0.00000 amount of people getting sick, um, then they'll approve it. So it's not so much that it's a different process. It's just that we delay it because kids are kids and as adults, we want to protect kids. And so that's the, but the science is, is virtually all the same. And it's really exciting that the kids have a hundred percent protection, protection from the vaccine, from the Pfizer vaccine, which is about 94 to 95% protective in, in adults, which is great. Dr. Bertley, I wanted to ask you um, this next question, because even leading up to today's event, um, I was getting emails and there were some tweets about um, not taking the vaccine. So what is the message 
where do we start in getting the message about the vaccine to people who are opposed to vaccination? Yeah, so, so and related to that is, is things like vaccine hesitancy. Yes. And, and then the extreme, which is kind of like the anti-vaccine movement. So first of all, um, th there's really two buckets, right? And now because of coronavirus, three buckets. The first bucket is people are just, you know, staunch anti-vaccines and there's just nothing you can do to convince them for whatever reason. I'm not judging, I'm just saying it, it's hard. You can give all the data you want, they're anti-vaccines for whatever reason they have. Then there's a second group of people who are like, you know, uh, like, you know, they're not anti-vaccines, but they want to know, you know, and, and you can have a conversation. But whether you're an anti-vaccine person to and through or someone who's just thinking about it, scientists and experts have to not demean them, not ridicule them. You have to listen to their concerns mm -hmm. and then you have to meet them where they are to the best of your ability and then share in a democratic, open, transparent way. Here's the information and I'm sharing with you the information and feel free for you all to, to manipulate the information, ask all the questions, and then hopefully you can get to a place that's comfortable. What we're seeing now with coronavirus in that second group of kind of hesitant folks, it's really because of how fast this happened. Because there's a lot of people that, that have taken all kinds of vaccines, mm -hmm. right? So they're not anti-vaccine at all, but they're like, whoa, should I take this coronavirus? I think it happened way too fast. And this is where education is critical again. Did it happen faster than we've ever done any other vaccine in the history of vaccination? Absolutely, but there are three fundamental reasons for that. One, we weren't starting from scratch. So we all learned about this coronavirus pandemic when it broke January, 2020, but there have been several other coronaviruses over the last 20 years and scientists over the last 10 to 15 years have been developing vaccine candidates that, for, for these. So we didn't start from scratch when this pandemic hit us. We actually had like near final candidates. And so scientists around the world were able to quickly just tweak it to make it perfect for SARS-CoV-2, which is causing our current pandemic. Great. So we had our leg up there. We're starting at ground zero. So that shaved several years right there. The second thing is we didn't, we because of the urgency of this, we collapsed. Remember those clinical trials, phase one, phase two, and phase three? We combined phase one and phase two and we combine phase two and phase three to shorten that time significantly. So it doesn't compromise if you're testing to see if it's safe. It's just saying, instead of starting in 50 people and then hundred people, let's start with a thousand people and 5,000 people. And let's, it's so, they, so they combine these, again, all approved by the FDA and that allowed us to shorten the time, but you're still looking for the same indicators, adverse effects, sickness, what are those things? And what's critical to understand in case of vaccine development if you go eight weeks after receiving a vaccine and you haven't had an adverse effect, and I'm not talking about like a little bit of, of a little bit of sweat or a little bit of fever, you know, you can take time. I'm talking about a serious adverse effect. After eight weeks, it drops off a cliff. If you get through eight weeks, you know, and so now if you think about how long these vaccines have been testing before they actually got the approval. And now since we've got them approved in humans, we're talking about months and months and millions of people around the world now are long gone beyond that eight, that, that eight week or two month window. And we know that, wow, these are so far really safe. It's not like, you know, in five years, all of a sudden something might pop out. I want to be clear. I'm on television here. That's always a possibility. Anything is a possibility. But in terms of the safety and efficaciousness of it, by eight weeks, we know. And so that's why we feel really comfortable now. And the good news about this is, to your question, Tracy, is we're seeing a lot of people who were hesitant to the vaccines starting to feel comfortable, and they're now taking the vaccines, um, especially the Black and Brown communities who have legitimate gripes with, with how, you know, healthcare over the last 200 years or so. They're even seeing the data and they're comfortable. Hey, wait a minute, we've been part of these trials too. And you know what? They actually are safe. So that was a long answer, but I wanted to yeah. unpack all that. The, the, sure. the, third, the third really important thing is you've all heard the expression operation warp speed. Why is that important? That is critical to why we all have vaccines now available. When you're developing a vaccine, yes, it's for a medical reason and you want to help people, but there's usually a company behind it, Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, whoever, right? Well, it's a company and the company wants to make money. So normally what they do is they come up with an idea and they say, okay, we got this candidate vaccine. They go to FDA to get approval. Once they get approval, they test it for one, two, three, four, <coughs> however long. Once all of that looks good, then they go and get investors to say, okay, I have this vaccine. I have my FDA approval. I have my patent pending. Now, please give me you know, a hundred million, 300 million, a billion, $5 billion to invest because we're going to make a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. 
The problem is that's normally how the cycle goes. No one's going to invest in you until you know you, the vaccine works. We couldn't wait in the U.S. We couldn't wait in the world because this, this virus was killing us right now. We didn't have the luxury of waiting for years. And that's where the government was key. The U.S. government, European governments, South American governments, African governments funded in advance. So while they were testing these vaccines, they had the they were able to develop these hundreds of millions of doses that we're all using now. They didn't start developing them last week or even in January. They've been developing them for nine months. And those three things is what allowed us to get the vaccine so fast. So we didn't compromise on safety. We were just very creative because the planet and the 7.7 .7 billion people on it needed us to be creative. I'm gonna jump around a little bit, Dr. Bartley. So Tracy, I'm sorry, because I know we have some questions people submitted early on and I see some in our chat. But you were talking about vaccine hesitancy. And one of the questions from the pre-submitted um, registrants, they asked that if you already had COVID-19 and you have the antibodies in your system, why should you still get the vaccine? So that kind of falls along with the vaccine hesitancy. They're not hesitant to get it, but they're wondering, well, I have the antibodies. Yeah, that, need that's, a shot? that's a great question. So I'll ask the audience, um, have any of you had a cold? And some of us have had a cold, I've had a cold, or you've had the flu, right? Well, the cold and the flu are both caused by a bug. Once you get a cold and a flu, your body makes antibodies. You have those antibodies, right? What happens next year and year after? Do you get a cold again? Did you get a flu again? Like, so things like the cold and the flu, you can get once a year, twice a year. You'll certainly get it within three or five years. It will recur, right? So just because you got infected with something and you have protective antibodies in that moment, it doesn't mean that they will last forever. And so just like you get a flu shot every year, right? You, we may, who knows, we may need to get a booster shot of coronavirus vaccine in three years, five years, 10 years. You know, I, I'm hoping it's not gonna be a yearly thing. I doubt that, time will tell, but that's mm -hmm. why. So if you got infected and you, they measured and they have antibodies in you, we don't know how long those antibodies are gonna last. So it could be nine months later, your antibodies may have gone down a little bit. You get exposed to somebody else who has coronavirus and boom, you get infected again. So you should get the vaccine. And we just got a question sort of related to this. Once we're vaccinated, for how long can we expect to have antibodies and be safe from the virus in its current state or from mutations? Yeah, that's a great question. Whoever asked that question, if you can figure out that answer, you will be the next billionaire on the planet. And, and I mean that seriously in that the, the fact of the matter is we just don't know. And why do we just don't know? Not because we're not asking the right questions. We don't know because it takes time. Coronavirus just hit us here. It's been just over a year. In five years, we can answer that question perfectly because we're gonna have enough time to measure all the different people who were infected with coronavirus and survive. All the people who've been vaccinated over six months, nine months, 12 months, and who are surviving. Then we measure their antibodies and we're like, wow, this is like 15 months later, they still have antibodies. So we just don't know yet, but with time, we'll be able to answer that with 100% accuracy. And I think coming off of that too, so you're basically saying we get vaccinated because you know, every year, like the flu, you might get the flu next year. So you get the vaccine now. But somebody asked though, once I'm vaccinated, can you carry the virus? Yes. So so here, here's the great thing about, about how the immune system works is you might still get exposed to something. So let's say you were either, you got coronavirus and you recovered or you got vaccinated. Now you're feeling protected. And you went somewhere and some, you know, a few people had coronavirus around you and you got exposed. So they sneezed or they talked or you're in a social setting and people are getting excited and fluid or aerosol and boom, it hits you. You breathe it in your nose, your mouth. Now you're exposed to it. The vaccine, exactly. No, the, the vaccine, the vaccine or your protective immunity from being infected before, but let's talk about vaccines. The vaccine does, can't prevent that from happening. The vaccine, you can't be at a bar hanging out with your friends and then because you're vaccinated, someone sneezes on you and the vaccine jumps out your body and puts out a shield. Like the vaccine doesn't work that way, right? What the vaccine does is if you get exposed and it's internalized in your body, the vaccine has a stronger immune response and can inhibit it from replicating and certainly replicating out of control to the point where you get sick. That might take a day or two days or three days. So you might have virus in you you're not feeling too sick because you've got an immune response that's working really hard and it's controlling it and finally getting rid of it. But that biology is still happening in your body. So yes, you can be vaccinated. You're protected from getting sick and hopefully dying, 
but that doesn't mean you can't get exposed or actually infected with the virus for a little bit of time. That's why you need to get vaccinated. Um, and that's why we still need to social distance for the next right. few it's months and wear masks for the next few months, because even if you're vaccinated, you know, there's still that small chance that you can get exposed and transfer to somebody else. And you can still spread it then, right, Dr. Burley? I mean, if you get, you're so contagious and that's why, like you said, still wear the mask, so. Yeah. Now the good news is, for all accounts, based on the data, you will be less contagious than somebody who's not vaccinated, and you'll be less likely to spread it. But I think the guest question was, could you still be infected and be exposed and carry it? The answer is yes. Here's another question, Dr. Bertley. If DNA vaccines are so much more stable, why use the RNA vaccine? What are the advantages? Yeah, that that's a great question. So I guarantee you, Johnson and Johnson is like ding, and Pfizer and Moderna <laughs> like no. Oh! Why do we use DNA vaccines? Um, and, and the only reason why I say that all jokingly is it's not so much that the, the one's more effective than the other. Pfizer vaccine, I mean, if you remember, right? Pfizer and Moderna, their efficacy rates, their, their um, success rates are around 94 and 95% respectively. Two doses, but 94 and 95. In comes Johnson and Johnson's. Anywhere from 66 to something like 66 in kind of the average population, 66% effective, and roughly high 70s, low 80s for older population. Not at that 95, right? But it's only one dose. So, you know, you can argue that the RNA is that much more effective. I don't know if we gave Johnson Johnson two doses, would it bump up to be at 95? Mm -hmm. You know, we don't know because it, it, Johnson Johnson elected not to do that because it's much cheaper to have one dose and it's mu you're much more guaranteed to get more people vaccinated because you don't have to worry about them coming back, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's not that people knew, hey, wait a minute, DNA vaccines are going to work perfectly. Oh, let's just try RNA vaccines. People were trying to figure out, well, all of these technologies work. Let's test several. Let's see what the data is, and then we'll see how we move forward. So in retrospect, your question is spot on. It'll be interesting in five years or 10 years from now to see which coronavirus vaccine is going to be on the market. Is it just going to be a DNA vaccine, or will they keep the RNA? We'll know as we keep looking at more data. But for now, it was a scramble to get vaccines to help planet Earth. And that's why we have all these different types. Well, there are questions just coming in left and right. And so that's good. I know, right? And so Casey's asking, <laughs> you need some water? <laughs> no, no, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Um, and so this again goes to, I think what you were talking about just moments ago about like, even though you're fully vaccinated, still keep your distance, but a parent wanted to know if I'm fully vaccinated as a parent, but my child is not, um, what should we adopt now to start living life more normally again while still being able to protect our children? Yeah, that's a, that, that's a question. Ooh. I'm just going to give a general answer. I'm not acting as your physician, so I don't want to give you direct medical um, um, direction. But in short, you know, the, the simple answer is the more people get vaccinated, the safer things are going to be. So if you're an adult, you're vaccinated. If there are other adults in the house, they're vaccinated. You all can do a lot of stuff as a hub, great. But at the end of the day, if you go out to a place where there's a lot of people and a lot of adults and a lot of kids and you have no idea who is vaccinated or who isn't vaccinated and your kiddo is running around or hanging around, you know, depending what the events that you're attending, they could be exposed to somebody who has it, you know, and they can then get infected. So the short answer is we still just need over the next several months to, and I know it's hard, but to just try to practice as much as possible still wearing the mask when you're up in, in big public settings and social distancing as best as possible. Cause, cause again, to the, to the great questioner, you just don't know who's who you just don't know who's vaccinated out there, you know, unless mm -hmm. we start carrying around on our forehead, we just don't know if they were infected. We don't know if they are infected. We just don't know. So you just want to keep be as mindful as possible. Of that. So can you, kind of build on that and talk about what it will take for us to get to herd immunity? Because I feel like everybody's talking about herd immunity, herd immunity. It seems elusive. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll use a great example. So have you ever, most of us have at one point either driven bumper cars at amusement park, or at least we know what bumper cars are, right? <laughs> Fair enough. So we're, this is Columbus. So let's say we're at Nationwide Arena, okay? And you have two bumper cars, okay? Mm -hmm. And they're on the rink. Blue Jackets aren't playing that day. They're on the ice. You know, the bumper cars, they're not going to hit each other. I mean, they can drive all around and avoid each other all day. 
Let's take that same hockey rink and put 55, 65 bumper cars on it. Now what's going to happen? So that 55 to 65 bumper cars isn't even close to coronavirus. Put a thousand bumper cars. You couldn't fit them, but put a thousand bumper cars on the ice. That's where we were a year ago with coronavirus, you know, and then certainly eight months ago. It was here. I mean, you remember those numbers, 5,000, 6,000. I mean, it was crazy, right? Too many bumper cars on the ice. Too many infected people on the ice. They can spread it around to other people. Mm -hmm. Now, the vaccine squashes that down. Where we're at right now is you probably have 20 bumper cars on the ice. You know, you can still maneuver and not hit somebody. So if a bumper car is an infected person, you might not, you know, hit somebody. Mm -hmm. Herd immunity is getting down to two bumper cars only on that. Now, the odds of you getting exposed, or the odds of you bumping into somebody who's infected are that much smaller. Now, the experts say herd immunity for coronavirus is around 70%. Different pathogens require different levels. Measles, herd immunity is around 80 to 85, 90%, right? So it depends on the bug, the combination of how contagious it is, how many people are infected, all these things factor into what the percentage should be. So right now we're thinking of 70% is that magic number where, hey, 30% of people might not be protected, but we have enough, we have a critical mass of protected people. We have a big enough free ice rink with no virus circulating that, you know what, we'll be okay. Even though there's two viruses, there's two bumper cars out there, man, I can skate through that, no pun intended, and not be exposed. Okay. So probably I want to talk about those clinical trials. You know, you showed us that great graph that showed like phase one, what happened to phase three. And I think a lot of people think, oh, phase three is when they do the emergency authorization because there was that phase, final phase that kind of allowed these drug makers to say, yes, we have 70, 80, 90% mm -hmm. um, success rate. But in truth, aren't they, these trials still ongoing? Because like you said, the variants are coming in, so they have to continue to test these. And we just had a verified today from China on our air this morning that talked about with these variants, can they just like slip them into the new vaccine to say, you know, this works, or does that have to be clinically tested as well? That's a great, great question. So the first thing is, once you start a vaccine trial, phase one, it's not over because you got emergency authorization. It's not over even when you get regular authorization. Those people were vaccinated. When, when I mentioned time previously, that's what I'm getting at. So, so if you've been part of a study, you're still part of that study. So you may have received that vaccine now a year ago. They're still testing you to see, hey, do you still have antibodies? Do you have T cells? Are you still protected, et cetera, et cetera? So now enter the mutant situation. Well, the neat thing about the mutants is, is we in America weren't testing for mutants. Remember I said April of 2020, there were already 30, more than 30 mutants. We knew that, but in the US, we were so busy trying to figure this thing out. We didn't actually isolate viral particles from infected people and do what's called a sequence analysis to see their, their genotype, right? Now we're doing that. So now combining that capacity and availability to do that with vaccine studies. So now people who are vaccinated, they can go back and if they get, so for example, someone who's vaccinated and um, we know the percentage of mutations for the Brazil mutation, South African mutation, you know, all the different mutant forms, you know, UK variant, we know the frequency of them out there. We know this now because we're testing. Well, then we should know how many people are infected. And if it turns out that non-vaccinated people I'm making this number up. Non-vaccinated people, 30% are infected with these new mutants, but vaccinated people, only 3% are infected with the new mutants. We know, oh, those vaccines are also protecting against the new mutants. If it turns out that, you know, you have 30% of people are infected with, with new mutants, and then you look at the vaccinated population, and it's also 30% are infected with the new mutants, that means this vaccine is not working for the new mutants. Again, to your point, Angela, that's why once you're in a study, you know, the FDA is still following, you're still going back regularly, giving blood samples. They're analyzing you to make sure they can best tell how long your immunity lasts, how protective it is against these other strains, and, you know, how we're going to get out of this mess. So that's a great question, but um, they're on it. Can you talk about, um, this is uh, some forecasting for you. Do you think COVID-19 is ever going to go away? Or are we going to, this is, it's just part of the, the bug 
Yeah, you know, life that we have. I, I get that question all the time, and, and it's a great question. Um, you know, and I always say, let's think about what we know about bad bugs out there. Ebola, HIV, tuberculosis, hepatitis, one, two, three, um, tetanus, syphilis, diphtheria, pertussis, measles, mumps, rubella. I mean, I can list a thousand different bad bugs here from very mild to Ebola will kill you in days. Not a pretty picture, right? Right. Of all of the thousands of pathogens or bad bugs out there, we have managed uh, in, in, in modern society to eradicate only two. If you think about when Jenner started in the 1700s to where vaccine development has come today, and not just vaccine development, all of medical care, we've only got rid of two bugs in the history of humanity. One is smallpox. Mm -hmm. 1977 was the last recorded case. Yeah. Um, 1980, World Health Organization said, whoop, there's no more smallpox. The other one is this bug called rinderpest. It doesn't infect us humans, but it infects rodents and, and sometimes cattle. You know, that was 2010, the United Nations says it's gone. Only two. And we all heard about smallpox. None of us, many of us haven't heard about rinderpest. There are four other programs that are ongoing. We, we got really close to getting rid of polio, but we just missed it. So we're still trying to get rid of polio. We're trying to get rid of this disease called Yaz. We're trying to get rid of malaria. We've all heard about malaria. And my last one, which is my favorite, is Draconculiasis, which is, you know, sounds like Dracula. It's really it a crazy infectious bug that causes severe pain and, and leads to debilitation. And there is no vaccine for that. But the only reason why you get that is if you're drinking dirty water. So the World Health Organization, the United Nations campaign is not vaccines, but making sure we get clean water to all 7.7 .7 billion people. And it's actually working. So all of this to say, back to your great question, Tracy, is coronavirus around, is it gonna stay? Or are we going to get rid of it? Mm -hmm. A, we're not getting rid of it immediately. Let's be clear. So hopefully we'll get the herd immunity soon. And yes, we can get back to normal life, just like you had the flu, et cetera, and things, and you get a common cold. So we're, we're going to get back to normal, as you said in your intro, marks. But we're not going to get rid of coronavirus right away. It's going to hang around. If we finally do get rid of it, it's because there's a global campaign to take that herd immunity we talked about at 70% and get that up to like 90 95%. That's the only way we're going to get rid of it. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean we're going to be like the flu and require a shot every year? Mm -hmm. Hopefully not. Back to the answer to your question about how long does the protection last with these mutants and these variants. You know, hopefully our immune protection keeps us going for a year, two years, three years, five years. We might need a booster, just like you get a booster for measles or you get a booster for diphtheria. You know, but but Tracy, unfortunately, we're not going to get rid of it this summer. Um, we may not get rid of it forever. You know, um, it, it'll see. If you're asking my personal opinion it'll probably end up something like the flu. Where right now in this country, there are 10,000 to 50,000 people that die every year from the flu. And we don't think about it yet. These are people's loved ones. These are people's mm -hmm. moms, dads, grandparents. And we've been completely comfortable with it for the last few years. We have a vaccine and we try and no one wants to get the flu. But the fact of the matter is we live with it. That's probably where we're heading with coronavirus. I know we um, have about 10 minutes left with you, Dr. Burtley, and we certainly, I think, Tracy packed a lot into this today. Yes. So this is great. I do want to ask a question about um, the COVID, when we talk about COVID conversation. As a parent, I am waiting for COSI to reopen. June 3rd is the big day, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> and I remember, Dr. Burtley, like back in uh, last year, right? you had a couple of open dates, but the numbers just kept going up and up in terms of daily case numbers. Yeah. June 3rd, keeping our fingers crossed, because what is maybe the threshold that you guys are looking at when it comes to COVID daily case numbers and how do you weigh that against those being vaccinated to say, all right, the numbers are going up, but we have more people vaccinated so we can still reopen. See where my scale's going? I'm yeah. really confused. <laughs> no, no, you got you you honestly, that movement is exactly what we do inside COSI. So you're spot on. Um, you know, it's a great question. And for the record, let me be definitive. Yeah, short of you know, the earth opening up and swallowing us all whole. We COSI is opening June 3rd. Now, why can I say that definitively today as opposed to when we tried in the past? If the last time, for example, was November 20th, and you know in November, this country was crushed with the virus. Oh, yeah. To your point, Angela, the viral loads were so high in Ohio and the rest around the country that everybody else who was open, you know, the, the 30 or 40% of businesses are open, they were shutting down wholesale. There's no way Coast has a science because you can open up whenever you're shutting down. So we elected to stay closed. 
However, now we know we're opening June 3rd. The difference is one, we're getting a lot more control of the virus. People are practicing social distancing even before vaccines. People are social distancing more, people are wearing masks more, people get it. But the fundamental game changing dif difference, and if you don't take anything away from today's conversation, the takeaway this, the only thing that is getting us out of this nightmare pandemic that has gripped the entire planet and crushed and killed 3 million people on all the continents is the vaccine, period. There's no medicine. There's no, you can build all the hospitals you want. You can call with all the respirators you want. The only way to get this globally controlled and the only way to get this controlled in this country is through vaccines being available and being taken. And that's the definitive difference with when COSI said we're opening June 3rd, because people, first of all, the vaccine is available. And we know that in about three more weeks, it'll be available to any US, any adult in this country that wants it can get it. So back to your question, Tracy, we're hopeful we'll get soon to herd immunity. So the vaccine's available and people are taking it. And so by June, you know, it, even if it bumps up a little bit, you know, you get past 1,000, 1,500, maybe 2,000, we're still very comfortable because people are vaccinated outside in society and our building is hyper clean. We've <laughs> invested in this photo hydro ionizing technology, which is really fantastic. Basically leverages UV radiation to kill not just viruses, viruses, bacteria, parasites. So we know we have the cleanest breathable air inside COSI and that's really how people get infected. So a combination of what we've done internally for our building from an investment standpoint, the combination with the vaccines being available, people taking them, June 3rd, and you said it, Tracy, we're getting back to normal, call it a new normal, call it a novel normal, call it a cosi normal, but it's normal. <laughs> so can I ask you, um, clearly you love science. And I think over the past year, we've sort of changed the way we talk to each other. I mean, people are talking about RNA and DNA, like it's nothing. I mean, what are you, what's your reaction to that? You know, I, I'm so glad you asked that question. You know, it's been a tough year for all. But I always, I'm a hope, my wife will tell you, I'm forever a hopeful, hopeful optimist. I always, mm -hmm. what's the good news? Well, there's a few little silver linings. One of the silver linings with this pandemic is, you know, we talk about this expression woke. Well, there's a scientific wokeness. I mean, there's still science in marriage and all that. That's always going to be the case. But right. people, to your point, Tracy, are actually more comfortable throwing out words. I mean, who knew about herd immunity 13 months ago, right? Who knew about DNA versus RNA? Who knew about, you know, vaccine development? I mean, just all these things we just, we now are more comfortable talking about. So I'm hoping, much like Me Too movement, much like Black, mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter, I'm hoping that there's stickiness to this interest in science yes. that, you know, once we get back to that new normal, people will still care. It doesn't mean you have to become a PhD scientist. You don't have to become mm -hmm. Dr. Anthony Fochi. No, that's not the point, but feel comfortable it's okay to ask questions and feel comfortable learning about science. So that is, a, a, for me, a silver lining. And at COSI, it couldn't be, we couldn't be happier to, to know that people are more interested in learning about science. That's great. That's great. It is. And I think really the, the biggest takeaway here is, is that the science is dictating our behavior, but it's almost like a moral compass that should dictate the why. Why are we doing this and you talked about it you know the, the three million deaths worldwide and what we're doing for our families because so many people want to get together with their parents and grandparents and they're so confused about what do I do but the science is helping us understand the why yeah you know I, I'm glad you said that as well I mean science you know a lot of times people think science they confuse science with facts you know science isn't facts science is actually a process you know, Socratic, you, you ask a question, hey, yeah. why is the sky blue? Why is this happening? In this case, how do we develop a vaccine? That's the question. And science looks to dig into that as best as possible and get as close to a solution as, as possible, which is what we did with the vaccines. And the cool thing about science, and, and Neil deGrasse Tyson has the best quote ever. The cool thing about science is it's true whether you agree with it or not. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because it's not a fact. It's not saying that people are using the four per se. <laughs> It's saying, here's the process that we know two plus two is equal to four. And that process, Angela, is what people have leveraged to get us out of the pandemic. And I'm hoping that, again, back to that silver lining to both your points, that there's stickiness to that so that people understand, yes, it's a, a physical process and philosophical process to come up with scientific movement and come up with the technologies that we use and leverage. 
but really there's that moral and ethical imperative to leverage science as a tool to ameliorate our human condition, regardless of race, religion, gender, orientation, or what have you. And that's the problem of science. And that's what excites us at COSI. Well, I thank you for showing me um, a different way to view Velcro. I will never look at Velcro this way. <laughs> and I have the ultimate comeback that you just said there. It's true whether you believe it or not. I love that. Yeah. It's right. It's cause, yeah, no, I love that. He said that about 10 years ago, and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm not. That's a good that. one. It's a great book. Dr. So, Bradley, we are going if, to look for your. If I can say the flip side, though, as a scientist, I say yeah. this proudly and loudly. Um, the best scientist or a real scientist is not afraid of questions. So yeah. any scientist that says, oh, whatever, you don't believe in science and has that arrogance, you know, tune out to them. You know, a, a real scientist needs to understand that, first of all, science works by asking questions. So there are no bad questions. And we just have to embrace those questions and as best as possible, help people see solutions if, if, we, if we have them or can lead them to that. So don't be shy to ask questions. There are no bad questions. You know, do, we love being skeptical. In fact, scientists are the most skeptical people on the planet. If you don't believe me, you de decide tomorrow you came up with a cure with breast cancer. You will have a line of scientists say, oh, no, you didn't. Here's why. Right. And they're challenging you, which is good, but they challenge you and you keep pushing back and finally you're like, da -da, see, it does cure breast cancer. So we love and we're not afraid of questions. Pardon? <laughs> we love to ask questions. There you Angela go. Angela and I. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. Dr. Burley, this has been a wonderful hour. Um, thank you so much for your time and inviting us to come and talk with you and your co I guess, about this. Uh, I will personally look forward to your haikus now every day. Did not know you did that every day, but certainly, Tracy, this has been enlightening, right? It has been great. And I want to thank everybody who's sending questions, such great questions. Um, and the good news is that this is going to be saved on the COSI Facebook page and on YouTube. Um, so if you want to watch it again, you can, and you can send it to a friend who didn't get to tune in. This has been great, Dr. Bartley. Absolutely. Well, Tracy and Angela, um, thank you so much again. Thank 10TV. Um, for, from us at COSI for, for having us on board. We, we really appreciate this. And it's just about sharing information. And as you said, Tracy, getting to that new normal. Let's hear it for new normal. <laughs> you got it. June 3rd, we'll keep the light on for you at COSI. Oh, we'll be there. You know right. it. <laughs> You got it. Thank you well, thank, again. Thanks so much. Thanks. And real quick, Dr. Burley, there were a lot of questions real quick on Facebook. Um, and, and we didn't get a chance to go to those, but I'm sure somebody like you or someone else from course, oh. I will be able to answer those on Facebook for our guests. A absolutely, Angela, thanks for that. Okay. And all of the questions and all the chat are gonna be saved. Any questions that were here, um, even those that are answered are going to be re-answered and will be located at COSI.org on our website or through our, our Facebook um, link uh, at COSI. So definitely check that out. Give us a little time because I know we've got a lot of questions. So give us a little time to, to edit and put the answers in there, but definitely come check us out. Um, we'll keep the light on for you. And, and back to the haikus, Angela. I'm glad you're going to look at them. I'm not promising any Maya Angelou or William Shakespeare poetic grace, but there will be one every day. And so far it's been there. So... Thank you. Thank you, sir. Oh, that's terrific. You got See it. ya. Take care. Have Bye. a great day.